Hi, and welcome to the Fairwinds Energy Education Podcast. This is a breaking news podcast, as we've just had news that Energy has decided to close and decommission Vermont Yankee. And this is the fifth nuclear unit to be shut down this year. Arnie, what does this mean? Well, you know, I said when the San Onofre unit shut down that this was a seismic event for the nuclear industry. And this is the next ripple in that, in that earthquake. Um, th these five units were San Onofre, Crystal River plant, the Kiwani plant, and now Vermont Yankee. All of them were shut down because economically it made no sense to continue to run the nuclear units. You know, these things are getting old, and they break, and they, they have enormous staffs. The staff on a nuclear unit is uh, around 650 for, for my Yankee, higher for San Onofre. To get the comparable power out of, out of another power plant, you could get about uh, 100 people. So a nuclear plant is much more costly to operate. Sure. And wasn't the Vermont Yankee plant the same model as the Fukushima Daiichi? Yeah, the cost to make the modifications to make Vermont Yankee safe would have been well over a hundred million bucks. On top of that, there was other modifications that needed to be made, and they also needed to spend 50 million on fuel. So rather than make a quarter of a billion dollar investment in the plant, they decided to pull the plug and um, um, shut the plant down at the end of this, this refueling cycle. It's still a ways off. It's still 14 months away in 2014. But the plan is now that they're going to walk away from a licensed nuclear power plant because it's just too expensive to run. Right. And so what's that going to mean? How is this going to happen? How are they going to decommission the plant? And what's it going to mean for public health? Yeah, all these five plants are facing that same question. What are we going to do to uh, safely decommission these plants? Um, and they're all in the same boat. They, they, they have to take the nuclear fuel out of the reactor, put it in the fuel pool. Now, Fukushima Daiichi shows you the fuel pools remain hot for three, four, five years, physically hot. After about five years, they can take the, the fuel and put it into dry cast storage. The dry cast of Fukushima Daiichi survived the earthquake and the tsunami just fine. So it's clearly the safe thing to do is to get it out of the fuel pool. But you can't. You're stuck with it there for five years. So whether it's San Onofre in California or Vermont Yankee or Kiwani or Crystal River, the nuclear fuel's got to sit for five years before it can go to the safer way of storing it, which is called dry cask. In the meantime, what they'll be doing is taking the water out of the systems in the plant and basically making sure that there's no new leaks to the environment. That doesn't mean that old leaks might have been undetected. That's already happened. But with the fuel out of the fuel pool and all of the liquid out of all the pipes, uh, it's not very likely there'll be new leaks to the environment. You were saying earlier that it's possible for unintended things to happen and for the radiation to get out through other means. Yeah, there's a problem. When you put a plan in what the NRC calls safe store and what, what we at Fairwinds call lazy store, it's um, an opportunity to walk away from the plant for 60 years, six zero years, long time. They, they're doing that out at Hanford at the reservation out there where they had uh, nuclear reactors from uh, the bomb program. And what happens is when you try to button up a power plant like that, rodents get into it, wasps get into it, the birds get into it, and you know now we're finding radioactive birds' nests, radioactive wasp nests, and radioactive rabbit droppings out in the field. So when you put a plant in a safe store mode, animals are going to get into that plant just like a house that's abandoned, and they're going to carry out the radiation. At Hanford, they can find the radioactive rabbit droppings from a helicopter at about a couple hundred feet high. That's how radioactive these things are. When they find the rabbit droppings, they send people out to kill the rabbit, and these guys are paid pretty well. They call it bunny money when they go out to, to prevent these rabbits from getting out into the environment. So yeah, putting a plant in a safe store doesn't necessarily keep the radiation inside it. Uh, rodents and wasps and things like that can get in and carry that radioactivity out into the forest. 
So then the public health is definitely still at risk here. Yeah, the best thing to do for all five of these nuclear plants that are shut down this year is to quickly take them apart. You have to wait five years. There's no way you should do it faster. One, the fuel can't be moved. But two, from a radiation exposure standpoint, you don't want to irradiate employees needlessly. After five years, the plant's about as less radioactive as it's going to get for 300. So you may as well start on dismantling the plant at that point. Then what should happen is within another five years, it can be turned back into a field. So the process can take 10 years. The people at San Onofre would get their beach back. The people here in Vermont would get the, the land that's right along the Connecticut River back. It can be done quickly. There's no reason to wait 60 years, except money. Well, can we talk a little bit about examples of other decommissioned plants and how that's been either successful or has failed? Yeah, yeah, right here in New England, we've got two examples. One's a good example. Maine Yankee was shut down and within 10 years decommissioned within budget. And now it's just a, a field. On that field is all the high-level radioactive fuel because nobody has any place for that. But the remainder of the plant, you'd never know it's there. The, the bad example is also in New England down on the Connecticut River called Connecticut Yankee. They started to decommission the plant and found a leak under the plant that no one had noticed for 40 years that was putting radioactive strontium down into the, uh, the water table. That added a billion dollars to the cost to clean up the plant. So what happened in Connecticut is that the Connecticut ratepayers all picked up a billion dollar bill. They spread it out in their electric bills over 10 years so that for 10 years, everybody's electric bill was inflated by a, 100 million a year to pay for it. The good example is Maine. The bad example is Connecticut. Both are Yankee units. Maine actually did a better job than required by the NRC. The NRC allows a, a site to be released if it's 25 millirem more radioactive than it had been before. Maine Yankee said, no, that's, that's not adequate for us. We want it to be 10 millirem more radioactive than what it had been before. And while not in law, there's this term called greenfield. And that really comes from Maine Yankee. And clean site, a greenfield site, is something that's called 10 millirem above uh, standard. But if you let the Nuclear Regulatory Commission declare a site safe, it can easily be two and a half times higher than the Maine Yankee standard. If something were to happen at Vermont Yankee, like happened at Connecticut Yankee, who would be picking up the tab? Well, who would be picking up the radiation would be the people down the river, which Vermont Yankee is right on the edge of Vermont. So mainly it would be people in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New Hampshire who would be picking up the radiation if it leaked into the Connecticut River. But who would be picking up the tab is Vermonters. The NRC is allowed the power plants to become what they call LLCs, limited liability corporations. And Vermont Yankees, one of them. If they don't have enough money, they go bankrupt and you can't get through that plant to get to the parent corporation. So for years, Vermont Yankees sent money up to Entergy, but after a bankruptcy, that gate closes and Entergy doesn't have to send any money back to Vermont Yankee. So the people left holding the bag financially are Vermonters. The people left holding the, the radiation are people in you know, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Connecticut, the downriver communities. Somebody else made all the money and we're the ones who are experiencing all the negative aspects. Yeah, you know, and, and we don't have any say in this. This is federal law. So it's not like uh, the, the people in Vermont can force Vermont Yankee to give more money into the decommissioning fund. The NRC would say, no, they're uh, adequately funded as far as we're concerned, and the state has no authority. I disagree with that, but uh, the, the way the law is written is that the, um, uh, the states have very little say over how quickly a nuclear plant can be dismantled. Well, and how much is it going to cost to decommission this plant? And how much money do they have in their decommission fund? Well, the NRC requires for a plant like for my Yankee about 560 million. That's what the NRC formula is. But it's such a simplistic formula. It's literally a paragraph of how to figure out the cost to decommission a plant. 
Vermont Yankees got 590 million set aside. So by the NRC's criteria, there's plenty of money. But in fact, it will cost about a billion. So the NRC formula is wrong, and yet the NRC is enforcing these plants to put more money into the fund. Why is the NRC's formula so off? The General Accounting Office did a study on that, and the NRC has promised to reevaluate its formula in the next couple of years. But still, every nuclear plant that's been decommissioned has exceeded the amount that they had set aside for it. It's always come out of the ratepayers' hides. You know, the NRC is trying to make nuclear power plants cost competitive, and if they really demand it that the decommissioning funds be adequately funded, that's just one more nail in the coffin on nuclear power. It's much easier to defer those costs 60 years on kids that aren't even born yet, rather than admit that the nuclear plant costs more than what they're claiming. We've been seeing so much news about Fukushima, and like we mentioned earlier in this podcast, it's the same reactor model. With all this release of radiation, what can we be worried about here? Yeah, the Fukushima site's a mess. There's tanks on the site, more than 700 of them, some of which are leaking. Uh, what made the news last week was one tank in particular leaked a lot, but all of them are leaking, and that's really not the single biggest source of radioactive water that's leaking into the groundwater. The big problem is that the nuclear reactors themselves have cracked floors. The buildings in those reactor buildings have cracked floors. And groundwater is getting into those buildings and becoming contaminated and then leaking out. So in addition to what's in those tanks, the, the physical plant itself is contaminating the groundwater as well. So what Tokyo Electric tried to do was to build a wall along the water. They injected basically a concrete kind of a compound and made the ground less porous. That's not a good idea. It was a poor idea. Because what happens is the mountain that's behind Fukushima continues to pour the water into the ground. Now it's got no place to go. So now the groundwater is rising and rising and rising and likely overtopping this wall, certainly going around it on the sides. So we've got radioactive water that can no longer be stopped from getting in the ocean. It's worse than that, though, because the radioactive water has made the site seismic response different. The buildings that were on dry land are now on mushy land, so that if there were to be another earthquake, the seismic response to these buildings, which was already marginal, is further compromised because the ground that they're now on is wet, soggy soil where before it had been firm. And while it is more unlikely that we would see uh, seismic activity around Vermont Yankee, if Vermont Yankee were to have an accident where a bunch of radioactive material were leaked, what would be the consequences that we would see? You know, that's a, a lesson from Fukushima that America and the world is not paying any attention to. Gordon Edwards and I talked about this in a podcast a couple of months ago. But if a plant, an inland plant, were to have the problems that Fukushima Daiichi had, you'd likely wipe out the watershed for 40 million people. You know, the Pacific's a big ocean, and, and you get to spread that radiation out over a large body of water. If Fukushima were on a river, the Mississippi, or on the Great Lakes, or on the Danube, or, or on the Rhine, or you know, a major river in a, on a continent, that river would be inaccessible to human use for generations, and the people rely on that water to drink. So the downstream cities would essentially become ghost towns because they couldn't rely on their river. So the consequences of a Fukushima accident on the Pacific are really bad. But should that accident have occurred on a river or the Great Lakes or, or, or an inland estuary, it would be much worse even than that. And policymakers aren't talking about that. It's not as though we're going to have a tsunami on the Connecticut River. Certainly, there are other threats to the power plant at Vermont Yankee. Yeah, you know, Vermont Yankee says that all the time. You're not going to get a tidal wave zooming up the river. You're not going to have an earthquake, so therefore, don't worry, be happy. But the root cause of the accident was the loss of offsite power. That happens all the time at nuclear plants. And the secondary cause was that the ultimate heat sink was destroyed. That happens as well. There's been places where the cooling systems for power plants have been ineffective. So when the power plant loses its power from offsite, 
it needs to rely on its diesels. The diesels have to be cooled. So it could be a terrorist action or it could be a hurricane like Sandy almost did it down in New Jersey. There are numerous ways to cause a loss of offsite power and a loss of the ultimate heat sink. It doesn't have to be a serious earthquake and related tsunami. And I think that's a, the lesson of Fukushima that, that people should take away. is not that what the nuclear industry says, well, it's a, a once in a, in a zillion probability event of an earthquake that bad. It's not about the earthquake. It's never been about the earthquake. It's about loss of offsite power. happens all the time. The loss of the ultimate heat sink can happen all the time. Uh, there's a plant down in South Carolina called the Oconee plant, which is downstream of a huge hydroelectric dam. If the dam were to be sabotaged or if the dam were to fail, we'd have three nuclear plants in exactly the same situation that Fukushima Daiichi are in. So it doesn't matter. You don't need a tsunami to cause this, this kind of event. So over the last couple of weeks, we've seen a lot of news surrounding nuclear issues. Let's take a moment to sum them up and then talk about how they're impacting public health and public safety. We've got 50 nuclear plants shut down in, uh, in Japan right now. Likely will stay shut down for a long time because the news from Daiichi is so bad that no one in Japan has the appetite to, to start those units back up, despite the fact that the government wants that to happen. And here in the States, we've had a, a seismic ripple, five nuclear plants that are operating shut down, five others that were in the licensing process shut down. Nuclear power backing up worldwide right now. That's an important seismic event in the nuclear industry, and people shouldn't forget that. And by the nuclear industry's position, don't worry, be happy, everything's going to be fine. For the people uh, in Japan and the people on the West Coast, there is a wedge of radioactivity working its way across the Pacific called a plume of cesium-137, strontium, and, and other isotopes. The plume is about a year away from hitting the coast of uh, the Pacific Northwest. It's not over. It's not like it's going to hit and then go away. The nuclear plant is continuing to leak. That plume is 10 times more radioactive than the ocean was before. The cesium in the ocean uh, from bomb testing was the only source of radioactivity, and now it's 10 times that, and likely to grow, because the Daiichi site is going to continue to leak into the environment for years to come. So I think what, what we all should demand is, one, get rid of Tokyo Electric. They, they have no, no right, no capability to decommission that site. We need a first-rate engineering firm in there to do it. But the other thing people on the West Coast should demand is transparent analysis of the fish. There's no state organization that's sampling the fish, no government organization that's sampling the fish, and telling people what the numbers are. If the government's sampling it, they're not telling anybody. And I'm uncomfortable with that. I want to know what that number is, and I think as citizens, our government owes it to us to tell us how radioactive the fish are in the Pacific. We're not getting that right now. There's probably good science being done, but uh, citizens are not allowed to know what the government knows. This podcast has been a production of Fairwinds Energy Education.